Hi guys! As you might have seen, I created my first short film using Unreal Engine and I thought I'd take this time just to reflect on how that process was, what I learnt during my time making the cinematic and what I would do differently now because there is a lot that I would do differently now. For those of you who might not be aware, Unreal Engine is a games engine. It's made by Epic Games, who also made Fortnite, which also uses Unreal Engine. However, it's becoming increasingly more popular to see game engines be used in the film space as well, which extremely excites me. If you've been following me for a while, you know that I have been in this weird middle ground between loving film and loving game development, and now that it's coming together, it's extremely exciting. One of the most coolest ways that I've seen it used in a film scenario is with The Mandalorian and they made real-time rendered 3D scenes using these gigantic LED screens so that the actors could act within small spaces but really think that they were on like Tatooine or something like that. The 3D scenes could even move due to the camera angles or how the actors were moving and responding to the environment and it, pff, it just blew my mind. You can watch a whole documentary on Disney Plus but what did I learn while making my cinematic? I certainly did not make anything as grand as what The Mandalorian has done, no. But uh, I made something cool and I'm proud of it. If you haven't seen it already, watch Forgive Me Now, my horror short film, because there will be spoilers ahead. Okay, are you back? Great. Thanks for watching, by the way. Really appreciate everyone that has done and left me loads of feedback. I always appreciate the feedback. I will start off by saying this project was a year long process or perhaps even a bit more than that actually because it took me a long time to write the short story and then it took me a long time to work with Jamie, the producer at Horizon Productions who created an amazing soundtrack and then it was on to the nitty gritty getting everything into Unreal Engine. So I'm going to touch on that today but there was way more to that project. Number one. Set up your project's exposure settings. Or actually just look at your settings anyway and check that everything's in shape. I spent an awful long time trying to get the right look and feel of my environment. What I did was I was playing around with the lights, I was creating it how I wanted it to be, and then I realized that throughout my cameras and my scene, weird dark and light patches were happening and I wasn't sure why, and then I realized way, 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 way too late that my project had auto exposure on and that was automatically updating the light in my scene. Derp, derp, derp. All you have to do is go to the project settings, look for auto exposure, click it off and then reboot your project and you're good to go. When you're making a cinematic, it's best to just make as many things manual as possible because you don't have to worry about a player going in and interacting with the world and the world having to adapt to that. You have full control over what the viewer is going to see. So you wanna make sure that it looks exactly how you want it to look. Number two, I would say test the size of your map. As you're making your environment in a level, you're dragging and dropping in your 3D models, you're placing everything together, making sure it looks good, you've probably got your skybox. Don't do what I did. <laughs> Don't get to the end of that process where you're pretty happy with the placement of all of your, your assets and your models, and then bring in your point lights, your spotlights, your rect lights, and your particle systems, and realize that your level is far too big for the lights to even register. It was crazy. I put it on its largest size and brightness and I saw no light. And then I realized it's because my scene was huge and the lights just could not compensate for that. So I did manage to find a workaround. All you have to do is create an empty actor, put it into your scene, go into your world outliner, and then attach everything in your level to this empty actor. And then you can just change the scale of that. But it's still not great. Don't make the same mistake that I did. But that is your workaround if you do, so it's not a big deal. Number three, use ASICs from ASICs. 
Number three, use assets from the marketplace. I cannot say this enough as a solo developer. You cannot do everything by yourself and you should not expect yourself to either. If you can do that, then you are a genius and I don't know where you find the time, but you do you, boo. <laughs> Most of us cannot do that. When creating a scene, even if you're not actually making a game and you're just making a cinematic, you still need 3D models, textures, animations, particle systems, <laughs> normal maps, audio, and so, so, so much more. And it's very overwhelming even just to think about the amount of work that goes into creating a digital world. Don't do it all. <laughs> Instead, go to the Unreal Marketplace or even just look on websites online for 3D models and uh, animations and things like that. You can, you can buy them, there are some that you can use for free and you just have to credit them. Unreal Marketplace has uh, free and paid for assets that you can use and they also showcase free packs every month. I would like to give a massive shout out right now to Chameleon, which is a post-processing pack. I know we are not sponsored by them, but they are so freaking cool. It took me so long to find an art style that I liked because I wanted to have this weird art style that was kind of brush strokey, kind of reminded me of reading a book. Yeah, so as you get closer, you can see the detail. As you get further away, things start to get more paint-like, which I, I quite like. I found Chameleon and it gives you so many options for how you would like your scene to look. It has styles from a cartoonistic style to more kind of grungy, worn down styles for say a horror game. And they even have camera effects such as shaking or sci-fi pulses. They have so much in there and I managed to tweak around for probably days just to get this, this perfect, perfect look that I was really searching for and I couldn't have done it without the chameleon pack so link in the description down below. Okay, number four. I can't talk to you about a cinematic without talking to you about cameras. What cameras do you use? Well, I used all cine actor cameras. Is that what they call Cine camera actors? Basically the same thing. So these cameras give you a little bit more control over what it's doing, uh, mainly over the focus. So where you want it to be focused. You can also have uh, tracking on it so you can actually have it look at an actor and stay looking at that actor. So even if you're moving it manually, it will still be tracking, looking at a certain point that you've told it to look at, which is pretty cool, pretty useful. I actually didn't do that in this movie, short film, whatever the hell it is, throw away piece of work, but <laughs> because I wanted more control, I guess, I never really needed it to look at a certain point, but I can imagine it would be very useful, especially in game. See if you have a kind of cutscene where you're talking to another character and you want the camera to show both the player and the character they're talking to, but you don't want to manually handcraft those scenes. You can just run a piece of script that makes the camera look at each of the characters, um, that would be really useful. And when you are arranging your camera's focus, there is a draw debug plane, which is basically a purple plane that shows you the exact point in which you are focusing on. And that's extremely useful. I was doing this all on a laptop. Oh, that's my chair. My laptop is behind there. And uh, every now and then I couldn't see very well. So being able to focus on the purple plane allowed me to see where the focus was. Top tip though, do untick this debug plane because when you render your scene, it renders the planes as well and you don't want that. So make sure that you make them not visible again once you have set up your focus point. I'll talk a little bit about sequencer now, but we'll go into more depth with it a bit later on in the video. But to add these cameras to your sequencer, you can set it up under cinematics in the toolbar. There'll be a little plus icon next to the very top timeline, and then you can bind your existing camera to that. You'll then have access to that camera within the sequencer itself, and you'll be able to track things such as its location, which you will definitely be wanting to do. 
One thing that I would also note is that it doesn't automatically update your camera if you move it in editor. It's very annoying. What you have to do is go to the point in your sequencer where you want to be, move the camera where you want it to be, then go back to sequencer and make sure that you click on your keyframes to store that location. So many times I would move my camera, expect it to auto create the keyframes and it doesn't and then I move again and I've lost it. <laughs> very annoying. To view the sequencer timeline in real time, you can click the little camera icon next to your camera cuts in the sequencer and this will lock the viewport to what your cameras are showing. Also, when you have a camera selected, it will show you its view in a little window at the bottom right and you can pin this so that it's always active, which is really useful when you want to move actors in and around the scene of your camera. Number five, my bright idea to include video. So I'm not much of a 3D modeler as I haven't done it in a very long time and I have actually never done a 3D animation before so I couldn't rely on these skills to create motion or emotion in my scene. So instead I thought, well, what am I good at? Making videos? So I figured I would put videos into my scene. And this opened up a lot more possibilities, but also led to many, many problems. Okay, so I'm gonna try and walk you through my thought process behind this and also how I inserted the videos into my project. But a lot of it was trial and error, so I'm sorry if it's a bit rambly. Firstly, I needed a way to have one cohesive blueprint that would output multiple videos at certain points within the video render because the idea of having multiple videos just running on a loop while my poor little computer tried to render an almost half an hour cinematic really made me feel uneasy. So I thought if I could just have one actor that would change what video it was showing and perhaps have multiple instances of that, then that would be more performant. I thought, she says. So even just the process of putting a video into your level is a little bit lengthy. You need a file media source and then a media player and then a media texture. Basically, the media source is fed into the media player which is then fed into the media texture, which is then used to create a media material. Wow! <laughs> so many things just for one media output, it's crazy. I also decided to create a media playlist to have my wonderful idea of one actor playing multiple videos because it could be ran through the same playlist. And then the playlist would point to my media player. So instead of my media player only playing one video, it would play this whole playlist. A bug that I found though in doing this is that every time I opened up my scene, I realized that I was losing reference to the videos and I couldn't actually see them in the editor. And this is because the media player, every time it was closed, had actually lost reference to the file source, or in my case, the media playlist. So I couldn't see that preview, but every time I reopened it and I double clicked to reestablish it with the playlist, then boom, everything in my scene using that media texture that was ran from that media player showed the wonderful video again. <laughs> Oh gosh, I hope this isn't too uh, crazy. And it's just, I hope it's making sense. I had major, major, major issues with frame rate. For some reason, my videos were playing far, far too fast. I Googled this and found out I am certainly not the only person that gets this problem. Apparently it's okay in game. It's just that when you try to render out a cinematic video, the camera renders a lot slower than what the video plays. So when it shows back the video, it's not how you expect it to look because even when you play an editor, the videos play at the correct speed. But when you render out a cinematic and watch it back, your videos are like double the speed that you expected them to be. Very annoying. The workaround I found online was that I had to make my videos into a series of images and play them 
like that, which I am not going to do because I think my laptop would explode and the project would be huge. So instead I just exported slow motion versions of the video and used those instead and they came out looking kind of normal-ish speed. Some people in the in the comments of the video actually noticed the speed. So I created a blueprint actor which only held a plane and this plane had a material of the video material that linked to my media playlist. Even this didn't work how I expected it to. I had made functions that would trigger different videos to play and then to loop. And this was working fine, but I expected that if I had uh, multiple of these blueprint actors, let's call them plane one and plane two, two planes that should play videos. And I expected that if I ran functions on plane two and not on plane one, that plane two would show a different video and plane one would stay at its default video. That was not the case because the media player seems to only have one render output. So if you have multiple instances of that same blueprint using that same media material that then relays back to that media player, which relays back to that media playlist, there's only going to be one output. So what happens if you change one video on plane two and not on plane one? The video changes on both the planes. I feel like I explained that really badly. <laughs> Basically, there's one render output, okay, guys? But that's okay, because luckily I'm making a cinematic and you're not going to see two planes in the same scene. In summary, after all of this, I had my blueprint, I had my plane with my media material, and I had my functions set up to change the videos. And these were gonna be called from Sequencer itself. More on that later. Number six keying green screen through the materials and luckily this one was simpler than I had originally thought. My videos were green screen so I wanted to take away this green screen and have just the faces and whatever was happening in front of it be directly into the 3D scene itself. Now I am no environment artist, I am no texture artist, so I'm not gonna sit here and try to say that I knew exactly what I was doing because YouTube and Google certainly helped me. But I will put on the screen what I did to make this material. Once I had created this material, I could then create material instances, and tweak the values that I have put here, like the edge offset and the color gain and things like that. This meant that I could better key each individual video if I needed to do so. Number seven, using sprite animations. This was really fun. I decided to use hand-drawn sprites to give the storybook feel and bring that to life a little bit more. So I actually used rotoscope animation. I created these sprites in Photoshop and all I did for this was import the video frames to layers of the videos that I had taken for different movements. And then every six frames or so, I'd create a new layer that was a PNG and I could just trace over the top of the movement that I wanted to create as a drawn sprite. Then I could remove the video layers, leaving only the drawn ones and turn these into a sprite sheet. I actually used a layers to sprite JavaScript Photoshop script. What a sentence. <laughs> And it was developed by Jesse Freeman, so I will leave that in the description down below. So creating the material for this meant using the Flipboot node in Unreal Engine. Again, keeping in mind that I would make multiple instances of this, so I could change the column number, the row number, and the speed of the Flipbook. I love the look of the sprites in the 3D scene, I think it worked really well. <sighs> it's getting a bit, um, a bit long. A bit, a bit long, just a tiny bit long. Number eight, editing animation sequences. This is where I went completely wrong and I really, really wish hindsight is a beautiful thing that I had just used my brain just a little bit more. Remember when I told you that I'm no animator? Well, I didn't lie, I'm not. <laughs> And I'm sure if you look at the 3D animation in the short film, you'll be like, yes, yes 
We, we agree, agree with you. You, you are, are no animator. <laughs> so what I did for the video was that I saw that Unreal Engine had a 3D people scan pack, which again, I'll put in the description down below. It was free, so I thought, perfect, amazing, 3D people, free too, thanks Unreal Marketplace. And they came with ready-made animations to use with these 3D models. Unfortunately, the animations didn't really work for the kind of horror vibe I was going for, so I decided to tweak them because how hard could animation be, right? I opened up the animation sequence for these 3D models and I pressed the big plus key and all I did was look for the different bones that I wanted to change, move them manually, rotate them around a bit uh, using the timeline as well and then key in the new positions for them. Even if it ends up not looking like the best animation in the world, because hey oh, I'm not an animator, it'll look kind of creepy. I mean, if I saw that guy looking, walking towards me like this, I think I'd be kind of scared, don't in you? In hindsight, I would have actually gone to the website where I got the 3D people pack from, realized that I could have gotten an FBX version of the models, and then I could have put them into Mixamo, and I could have gotten a variety of animations from that amazing, wonderful site. But I didn't do that, so... um. But again, I was able to create that uncanny valley ambience, so it's a design choice, not a flaw. Of course not a flaw. Let's talk about Sequencer! We're finally at Sequencer! Number nine and we're talking about Sequencer! Sequencer is where you will do absolutely everything in your cinematic. It is the Premiere Pro, it is the, the film um, what are other film editing softwares? iMovie. Mm. <laughs> it is where you have all of your assets, all of your cameras. Transition. You get a fade in and a fade out and that's it, but that's still a transition. And you get your um, audio as well. And this is where you can edit it all. I found it really intuitive actually if you've used like After Effects or anything like that before because it uses keyframes. So it was relatively simple to get used to and work with. Once you have the sequencer open, you can manually add actors to track from your scene using the green add actor button. Is that what it says? No, it's a green track button. Or, alternatively, you can go straight into your scene in your editor, click on whatever you want to add into your sequencer, and look down through the options in the details panel, and there'll be a little, it's like a little script icon, and you click that, and then it automatically inserts the actor and that information that you want to be keyed into Sequencer. So that could be like its visibility, its scale, its material, anything like that. And then once an actor has been added into the Sequencer, you can even open that up and track its individual components. Yes, there is so much that you can track in the Sequencer. It's, it's actually amazing. They even have their own inherited switch material. And the coolest thing that I learned while using Sequencer is that you can trigger events. Ooh. With the event track, I was able to have control over the exact frame where I wanted my functionality to happen on that specific blueprint actor. I'm going to attempt to take you through my shoddy setup of a blueprint actor for my video actor that I was talking about earlier and how I triggered this through the sequencer event. When creating these sequencer events, it will ask you to bind it to a function that is available within that actor. So what I did in my video playing blueprint was I made individual functions for all of the videos in the playlists. This is probably a really long way of doing it, but ugh, it's what I did. Each function actually led to the same second function, which was switching the media. 
called switch media. These would be called through the sequencer so I knew when creating my sequencer events which video I wanted to call. The switch media function would then update the media material which actually was a public variable and I could change that within the sequencer itself. I should have really put a check here so I wasn't doing it every time but whatever. Then I could set the current playlist to be that integer that I had just fed through. And I did this through using the open playlist index node. Some of you might have noticed I had another function there. And this was a very hacky function that just allowed me to loop through each video and not the whole playlist. It's very hacky and it has a delay, so I'm not very proud of it but I had to put it in there. All it does is just binds to the end of the video that plays and then does a little delay so it makes sure not to start playing the next video and then it replays the whole thing again. Don't look at it, it's not my finest piece of work. Okay, so when you start using sequencer events, you wanna make sure that they're actually working, right? You wanna make sure they're getting called and that your blueprints are running okay, or your code if you're a programmer. You can't do this in editor, you need to run it to actually see that everything is firing. To do this is really simple. All you need to do is make sure that your sequencer plays on begin play. When you press play on the game, what will play is going to be the sequencer that you have just set up. So you can open your level blueprint and create a variable that points to the sequencer that you have just created and then create a level sequence player and feed that in there and then play. Give me a call if you want me to teach blueprints. And finally, here are my export settings. I thought you might want to see them. It took me a little a little tinkering just to understand what the export settings were all about and which ones would work best for me. I really implore you to please make some test renders first and while you do this you can use compression but that will really speed up the process when using compression zero will be the highest compression and lowest quality and 100 will be the highest quality and lowest compression and what i actually really love about these export settings is right down the very bottom under the animation tab you can actually have warm-up frames and delays even before the warm-up this allows some time just to run any particles that you might have in your scene, any animations to start playing, just so that as soon as your camera starts to record, it's going to get your level in the best way possible. And a sneaky, sneaky 11. Yeah, you thought we were at the end, but we weren't. And I also thought I was at the end. And then what definitely was not. I actually tidied up a lot of this in Premiere Pro. This is mainly because of the lack of transitions available. And I felt it made it look less professional. Hard cuts are great, don't get me wrong. But sometimes it's nice to have some differences in transitions and also titles as well. This also allowed me to not have to render out the audio with my video, which saved my render time a lot doing it out of Unreal Engine. And it already took quite a few hours. But oh, after that was all done, it was all done. <laughs> and it was out and put up on YouTube and out for you guys to watch and for me to ponder over. <laughs> so quickly, what would I change for next time? Well, what I did was very much experimental in this first cinematic. I kind of went overboard with the amount of things that Unreal Engine was giving me to play with, which is a lot of things, and I totally lost my vision. I was talking to you a bit earlier about how I wanted it to be like a storybook and have storybook feels and kind of painted vibes and I really agree with my choice on using sprite animation but I don't understand why I couldn't just stick to that. Why did I have to do that with the videos, with some 3D animation? I think it would have been a lot more unique and a lot more stylized if I had picked one and stuck to it. <laughs> also having a storyboard just helps anyway. It helps to set up the shots, set up the camera, 
the camera angles that you might want, the types of scenes that you are going to create. Um, I was doing everything on the fly. This is also because I didn't want to create a storyboard because I wasn't sure what I was able to do within Unreal Engine, so it, it makes sense. But in the future, now that I do know, I need to be doing some really good storyboards, really detailed storyboards, that's what I should have said, uh, good is subjective, and stick to them. I need to be tidier. I need to be a tidier developer. <laughs> See, this comes naturally to me when I'm in a workplace with multiple other people. I think if I know other people are going to see my work, I inherently am tidier. I guess it's like if you know someone is going to come around your house, especially if they're a family member, you make sure your house is tidy. You make sure that they're not going to scorn you for it. But when you're working on your own stuff, your own personal projects, or if you have your house to yourself, hey, in lockdown, no one's coming over, you might let things slide a little bit and get a little bit messy. And I definitely did that with this project and I wish that I didn't. At first you do everything quickly and you think, oh, not having a naming convention won't really matter in the long run. This is only going to be a short project anyway, she says. And then a year later, you're going to be confused. You're going to be like, where did I put this again? And I'm pretty sure I've already made an, an actor like this before. And um, it causes more headaches than it's worth. Use folders and group actors within the world outliner. Create a clean and understandable folder structure. Create naming conventions. All of the good stuff. All of the good stuff. And finally, it has really, really, really shown me that I need to upgrade from a laptop to a proper PC. So you'll be happy to hear that I have finally, finally bought myself all the parts I need to put together a PC. Unfortunately, I am waiting. Oh wait, shall I find out which graphics card I'm getting? Unfortunately, I am still waiting on my graphics card, which is a GeForce RTX 3070. I still don't really know much about hardware. I just rely on my friends that do. And it's not going to come for a while because I am number 215 in the queue. I hope I get this PC before Christmas. <laughs> but I'm so glad that I have bought a new PC and I know it will be here for next year at least and definitely by the time that Unreal Engine 5 comes along because with all those crazy triangles I don't think my little laptop will be, will be able to handle them. And now that I've talked so much I think I can't talk anymore. So if you have reached the end of this video, then thank you so much for watching. I really hope it's been educational. If not educational, I hope it's been somewhat entertaining or at least interesting. I have actually written a whole article on everything that I learned and the mistakes that I've made. So I will put that down in the link below. This has been a massive, massive learning lesson for me and I can't wait to work on more projects like it in the future. If you have any feedback for me from the short film or even any projects that I've done in the past that perhaps you'd like to see me dabble more in, uh, then do let me know. I am excited just to, to spend more time working on the projects that I really feel passionate about and those are ones where I get to tell stories and in particular dark stories. I, I do like the darkness. Thanks again for watching, really appreciate you being here as always. Also you can catch me every Thursday at around 9pm GMT where I live stream on the channel. So I hope to see you there, have a lovely day or evening, bye! It was extremely hard just to be able to view the floor where I wanted to. So you'll see back in environment two, um, the floor isn't, you can't really see it very well, uh, but you can just in front of the car. And that is not actually because of these spotlights, because I've got spotlights here for the car. Well, these are point lights, but I've, I've got point lights for the area so that you can see a little bit of the car. And I've got uh, spotlights to light up what's in front of it. 
And then actually I've got a Rex light, which I've been using all over the place. They've been extremely useful.